Hello, this is Erica Potis, and I will be your presenter today. Thank you for joining us on this third session of forest mapping and monitoring with SAR data. The focus of today's webinar will be on mangrove mapping. This session has been assembled together with Amber McCollum and Juan Luis Torres Perez from NASA Ames and Sean McCartney from NASA Goddard. For this training, we have four two-hour sessions, and there is one left, which is next Thursday, May 21st, and we will be presenting the same content in two different live sessions, one in English and one in Spanish. You can find all the course material on the website listed here, and after each session, we will have a question and answer portion. Feel free to type your questions in the chat box uh, along the way, and we will try to get at to as many questions as possible at the end. We will also post the questions and answers on our website after the training. So if we don't get to a question, uh, we, uh, but please take a look at the uh, Google Doc that we will post on our website. And also, you can email us, and uh, we will uh, get back to you uh, as soon as we can. We will have one homework, which will be available on the course website, and the homework will cover content from the lecture as well as from the exercises. To receive credit for the homework, you must submit all answers via Google Forms by the deadline. And we will announce the deadline and the homework at the end of the final session on May 21st. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all live webinars and complete the homework. Now, it does take some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive them about two months after the completion of the course. So the two prerequisites for this webinar series are the introduction to synthetic aperture radar and at the advanced webinar SAR for land cover applications. You can access those through the links here. And you also need to have a Google Earth Engine account set up. It's free, but you do need to register. All of the course materials are posted on the uh, our set course page, web page, and you can access that through the last link on this page. Okay, so this is where we are in this webinar series on mangrove mapping part three. There's one more uh, webinar, and that will be on Thursday on estimating forest stand height. So by the end of this presentation, you'll have an understanding of what are the challenges in mapping mangrove ecosystems and you'll understand the radar signal interaction with these ecosystems. And we'll also do a demo where you'll be able to uh, look at uh, doing some uh, uh, time series change detection in mangrove ecosystems and do some general calculations of mangrove biomass. So let's get started and just by providing a little bit of background on mangrove ecosystems and their importance. Mangroves are some of the most productive ecosystems in the world. They're found in intertidal zones in the tropics and subtropics, as shown in the figure on the left. And these ecosystems are comprised of trees or shrubs. They're found in shallow, sandy, or muddy areas that are adapted to estuarine or saline environments. And they are truly unique because they are the only trees capable of tolerating large amounts of salt in the water. And this capability, as well as surviving in low oxygen soils, is a result of their root adaptations. These ecosystems provide numerous services that sustain the livelihood of millions of people. And some of these services, in addition to carbon sequestration, include the protection of coastline and infrastructure against severe storms, nursery of uh, fish and crustaceans, and the production of lumber and charcoal. 
In addition, these ecosystems remove CO2 from the atmosphere through burial of organic carbon in its sediments, and they serve as huge carbon sinks. Though mangrove forests cover a small land area, less than 1%, they are estimated to be amongst the most carbon-rich ecosystems within the tropics. So mangrove ecosystems have recently been in included in the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the uh, Climate Mitigation Strategy, through uh, a number of wetland supplements. So their importance has really been elevated. There are different types of mangroves, primarily red, black, and white. Red mangroves are the most salt tolerant, while white are the least. Mangroves can exceed 60 meters in height and are able to attain high values of above ground biomass. In addition, their structures can differ, as you can see on the figure on the left. Some can have large curved roots, while others don't. These ecosystems are being threatened or lost. The rate of loss throughout the 90s was twice that of terrestrial rainforests over the same period. And it's estimated that about a third of mangrove forests have been lost during the last century. Some of the challenges in mapping mangrove ecosystems are the need for high resolution imagery since these ecosystems tend to cover narrow bands along the coastline. Also, given that mangroves are found in tropical and subtropical areas and along the coast, these are areas that are more prone to cloud cover, and hence finding optical imagery that is cloud-free over these areas can sometimes be difficult. And finally, the conditions in these ecosystems is dynamic. There are uh, differences between high and low tide, for example, and these differences can impact the characteristics of the, uh, the, the, the satellite signal, especially if you're using radar. Capture as well as from the X now let's discuss the SAR signal characteristics and mangrove ecosystems. So first let me start out by reviewing the backscattering mechanisms of the radar signal. Remember that the length of the wave will determine how it interacts with surface objects. The wave will interact with features on the surface that are approximately the length of the wave. The size of the components of a surface will determine its roughness. So surface roughness refers to the average height variations in the surface cover from a plane surface. And surface roughness is measured on the order of centimeters. So whether a surface appears rough or smooth to a radar, depends on the wavelength and the incidence angle. A surface is considered smooth if the height variations are much smaller than the radar wavelength. As a useful rule of thumb, the higher the backscattered uh, signal, the rougher the surface will look like, the surface being imaged will look like. All right, so let's review the uh, backscattering mechanisms that we see here. The first one is a smooth surface, also known as a specular reflector. And the smooth surface, it acts like a mirror for the in incident radar poles, such that much, most of the incident radar energy is reflected away from the sensor. And then that causes those areas to appear very dark. Open water surfaces tend to be specular reflectors. The next scattering mechanism is a rough surface. So when the surface height variations begin to approach the size of the wavelength, then the surface will appear rough. And a rough surface will scatter the energy approximately equally in all directions diffusely. And a portion of the energy will be backscattered to the radar. So sur surfaces that have some level of roughness will have a some uh, low backscatter, but not as low as low as a specular surface. So then there is the opposite mechanism. Oh, oh and the, the rougher the surface, the greater the 
energy uh, scattered back to the satellite. Okay. And then the other uh, mechanism is uh, volume scattering. And volume scattering refers to the energy, the radar energy being scattered within a volume or medium. And it usually consists of multiple bounces and reflections within the medium. Okay, whether it's a vegetation canopy, whether it's a snowpack, whether it's, uh, it's the soil. And then the final mechanism is double bounce. And that occurs when two smooth surfaces form a right angle facing the radar beam. And so the beam bounces, it bounces twice off the surfaces. And most of the radar energy is reflected back to the radar sensor. Double bounce is commonly seen in urban areas and in areas where there's flooded vegetation. And I'll quickly go through these examples just as a refresher on the intensity of the backscattered signal from these different surfaces. Okay, so when you have a dark, uh, a, uh, a smooth surface, a specular reflector like an open water body, the signal will reflect away from the radar. So in this case, the radar is in the left, and then the energy uh, that's being emitted from the radar is being reflected towards the right, okay, when it hits a smooth surface. So open water, road, and the pixel will appear very, very dark. And you can see that in this example, the area that's circled with a, in, uh, in yellow is part of the Amazon River. And as you can see, it appears very dark. And this next example shows rough bare surface. Um, so bare surface or a rough surface would be, say, a, a, an area that has been deforested, a, a tilled agricultural fields, uh, water uh, that has been roughened up by the wind. So whenever you have a, a, a some level of roughness, a, a small level of roughness, you've got um, the signal being scattered diffusely and part of that signal then is returned to the radar. And so for areas like these, uh, the um, backscatter intensity is low, is very low, but not as low as a specular reflector. So not as low as the previous example. This next example is volume scattering uh, by vegetation and the area in the, re in the yellow circle is a forest in the Amazon basin. And so the intensity of volume scattering depends on the physical properties of the volume, such as the variations in moisture content and structure. And they also depend on the radar, the wavelength, polarization, and incident angle. But the point here is that volume scattering will have higher backscatter than surface scattering and, and certainly specular scattering. So this is an example of volume scattering in a forest. And as you can see, scattering may come from the leaf, uh, the, 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 the leaf canopy at the tops of the trees, the leaves and the branches further below, the tree trunks and the soil at the ground level. So the figure illustrates all of the possible scattering mechanisms within a forest. There's direct scattering from the tree trunks, there's ground crown scattering, crown ground scattering, ground trunk scattering, trunk ground scattering, crown volume scattering. So there are uh, potentially many different possible interactions of the signal with the vegetation or different parts of the vegetation. And obviously the length of the wavelength will also determine uh, which will be the primary or the dominant scattering mechanism in, um, in, a, in, in a forest or wherever there's vegetation. And then finally, this example shows double bounce. It's delineated here by the yellow circle. And it's an inundated forest 
that means that the trees are on standing water and the signal is very very uh, strong very high backscatter and the reason for this is because the signal bounces off the water which is a specular reflector off the water underneath the vegetation and it bounces onto the tr tree trunk or other components of the tree and then bounces back to the satellite. So we can't measure the amount of standing water just that there is water above the surface. But because these uh, inundated vegetation is dominated by double bounce, uh, it's, it appears very bright on radar images. For mangrove ecosystems, there are three types of scattering mechanisms. There's direct or single bounce in yellow, volume scattering in white, and double bounce in red. The dominant scattering mechanism in mangrove forests strongly depends on canopy structure. Trends in volume and double bounce scattering vary much more than in other types of forests. In particular, in mangroves, volume scattering decreases in closed canopies and double bounce increases in open canopies. Inundation at the time of data acquisition also can have an impact on the radar signal in open mangrove forests. As you already know, HV polarization is dominated by volume scattering. And HH and VV polarizations, on the other hand, contain contributions from the ground because they penetrate deeper through the canopy than cross polarizations. HH is particularly sensitive to inundated vegetation and in such conditions will be impacted by the occurrence of double bounce scattering. Now in mangrove forests, however, double bounce that, that double bounce term that strongly impacts the HH channel may be reduced by the presence of roots, those uh, curved roots that are so distinctive in mangrove forests. Um, so what happens is that the, um, the radar signal is scattered and attenuated by these roots. L-band backscatter at both HH and HB polarizations is therefore several dB lower for mangroves than for other types of forests. And so here you can see that we have an L-band image from Alos Pulsar. And this is over Gabon. And the one on the right is an HH. The one on the left is HV. The dark areas along the coastline, uh, the, 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 all of those areas that are hugging the coastline within the red circle, those are mangroves, and you can uh, see that they are darker than the surrounding forest. This is an RGB of the previous image, where HH is in the red and blue channels, and HV is in the green channel. You can see much better the mangroves appearing as a shade of dark green along the coastline. Now, contrary to Contrary to inland forests, where backscatter increases with, vege with increasing vegetation due to volume scattering, for mangroves, backscatter from volume scattering is reduced in tall mangroves and is increased with shorter ones. In some cases, backscatter from volume scattering may become similar to that of inland forests. However, the texture of mangrove forests is, tends to be smoother than just uh, other non-mangrove forests. And this is in part because of inland topography and to the overall homogeneity of the mangrove canopy structure. If you have multiple polarizations, you can use them to identify mangrove forests from other land cover classes, especially at the longer wavelengths. Here we have a comparison of a mangrove ecosystem and the images on the top are L-band and the ones on the bottom are C-band. The relative impact of the scattering mechanisms changes significantly with radar wavelength. Ground and double bounce contributions increase with wavelength. 
C-band backscatter mainly occurs at the top of the canopy, and that strong canopy uh, interaction provides for increased sensitivity to canopy structure and consequently a certain potential for distinction of mangroves um, and other vegetation. So you can distinguish different types of um, mangroves with different canopy structures. Now the smoother canopies typically display a lower backscatter at both VV and VH polarizations than rougher canopies with a higher degree of structural variation. At L-band, there is attenuation of the signal due to those complex branches and aerial roots. This table contains a very nice summary of the general penetration depth and dominant scattering mechanisms in mangrove forests for different bands. For example, at L-band, microwave penetration into the canopy is about as large as half the canopy height. Scattering is dominated by single direct bounds in tall forest and volume dominates in the shorter shrub mangroves. Double bounce, which means uh, the backscatter will be very high, increases significantly the lower the biomass and the more um, open the forest. At a shorter wavelength, such as C-band, for example, penetration depth goes about one-third of, uh, of the top of the forest height. And the scattering mechanisms will consist of single direct bounce and volume scattering from the upper canopy with a small surface and double bounce component. This double bounce component will increase significantly in open forests and low biomass areas. This table contains the backscatter range for mangroves for different bands and polarizations. And these are general trends and may not be constant. So for example, backscatter may increase for low biomass shrub stands up to standing forests, where it then might decrease. It's difficult to map the extent of mangrove forests using radar alone, in particular when the adjacent inland cover is forest or shrublands because of similar backscatter. This can also be difficult with optical sensors because greenness may not be sufficient to distinguish mangroves from other vegetation types. This example shows mangroves in Cape York, Australia. And on the left is an ALOS pulsar image. So that's HH in the red channel, HV in the green channel, and the ratio of HH to HV in the blue channel. And then on the right are the same mangroves that can be discriminated from adjoining forests by using a Landsat-derived foliage cover product. Areas where mangroves have non or sparsely vegetated surfaces like sand or mud flats uh, on their landward margins can generally be discriminated and mapped because of their higher backscatter at both um, L-band, HH, and VV polarizations. There are several studies have recommended that the best approach to mapping mangroves is really a combination of data sets obtained from different sensors. Land cover classification can generally be performed with the radar backscatter as one of the layers, along with data, say, from optical instruments, such as uh, Landsat or Sentinel-2. And there are global maps of mangrove extent derived from optical data that can be used to extract the area of mangrove forests from radar data. And then, and these have um, recently been improved using ALOS data. Uh, but it's generally more efficient to start with existing but reliable uh, remote sensing products on, on where the mangroves are and then improve upon those with the radar data. One solution is to confine the mapping of mangroves to just those areas where there's a higher likelihood of them occurring. For example, mangroves are unlikely to occur in sloping grounds or at elevations above sea level higher than 10 meters. So that those baseline maps can initially establish where mangroves occur 
within a re some sort of reference year, and then you can refine that baseline based on changes within areas uh, that are most likely to occur. And, um, and then you can uh, quantify those changes using uh, radar data. Another approach is to use radar in combination with data sets from other sensors. So a land, a land cover classification uh, can be, uh, for example, generated from radar data together with optical data from either Landsat or Sentinel-2. Uh, classification results can vary greatly, though, with this approach due to the availability of polarimetric layers and due to um, availability of radar data at different bands. So you're going to get a different results whether you use L-band or C-band. So there have been studies that have found that Sentinel-1 did not provide significant improvement over Landsat-based land cover classification. Um, however, other studies have shown increased accuracy over 10% using fully polarimetric radar SAT-2 data. This image shows a classification of mangroves in Queensland, Australia. So the areas that are uh, pale green uh, have low biomass, and the areas that have high green, olive green, are areas of high biomass forest without prop roots. And the areas that are red are areas of high biomass forest with uh, prop roots. So while the literature is not definite on the backscatter signature of mangroves, it's got quite a range, the upper biomass level detectable with radar is similar to other forests. So it's about 200 tons per hectare for P-band, 100 for L-band, 50 for C-band, and 25 for X-band. After that point, the observed backscatter reduces due to absorption by the dense aerial root system found in mangroves. So, so it is different here, the, the backscatter response to what would be expected in a regular forest. A regular forest, as vegetation increases, backscatter will increase until it saturates. Here, as vegetation increases, backscatter increases up to a certain point up to a certain biomass level. And after that, it actually decreases. So you have higher biomass uh, mangrove ecosystems that have low uh, uh, backscatter. And we saw an example of that. We saw an image of that a couple of slides ago. Now, uh, this holds especially for HV. However, with in observing scrub mangroves at HH and VV, so these are low mangroves, low biomass, sometimes they, th these polarizations, HH and VV, also display high backscatter, and that's due to the increased penetration within the canopy and the double bounds interaction with either the water surface or water saturated ground. So this is a summary of the radar data available. And note that there are legacy uh, radar data sets, current and upcoming. The ones with the green box indicate that these data sets are freely available. However, if you look at the legacy data sets, JRS-1, for example, there is a global JRS-1 mosaic generated for 1996 uh, that is freely available. There is ERS-1 and 2 data over select areas that you can download for free uh, through the Alaska Satellite Facility. Uh, so CSAT, JRS-1, and ERS-1 and 2, uh, you can download those uh, data over select areas through the Alaska Satellite Facility. MBSAT was a European satellite uh, that operated at CBAN from 2002 to 2012. And then ALOS-1 is a Japanese SAR 
that operated actually from 2006 to 2012. And then we have the current SAR data sets. Um, the only one that's operational and the data are free are the Sentinel-1 data. These are from the European Space Agency. Again, that is a C-band sensor launched in 2014. And then upcoming, there's NISAR. We've talked about NISAR. That's a NASA and Indian Space Agency uh, satellite that will have an S-band and an L-band sensor. And then there's a biomass, which is a satellite that will have a P-band sensor, and that's from the European Space Agency. And that's, um, both of those are scheduled to launch uh, at around the same time frame. So that concludes the theoretical portion of this uh, webinar. And next, we'll move on to the hands-on exercise. Okay, so let me just start out by describing the exercise overview. Uh, we will learn how to process and analyze radar images. We'll actually be in radar images engine. And we will be um, using then Google Earth Engine as a platform for our analysis. So we will be doing some land use change or biomass, uh, sorry, um, mangrove uh, change analysis. And we will also estimate above ground biomass for mangrove forests. In terms of the software and data that will be needed for this demo, we will be using the Sentinel toolbox and the analysis is going to be done on Google Earth Engine. So you do need to have an account active on Google Earth Engine. Uh, both of these are free. There is no cost to set these up. In terms of the data sets to be used, we will be using global uh, L-band Pulsar 1 mosaics as well as Pulsar 2 mosaics. Those are already on Google Earth Engine. We will be using JRS-1 mosaics or mosaic. So that is from the, uh, the, the directly the, from the JAXA webpage. So we will download those and then import those in or import the tiles into uh, Google Earth Engine for analysis. And this is a 1996 radar mosaic. It's an L-band mosaic. And then we will be using a global mangrove watch vector and this delineates the mangroves it's a, a, a um, globally and we will be using that to narrow our area of interest so let's get started with the l-band sar mosaic tiles from jaxa uh, so jaxa has generated these global mosaics uh, from the data it's acquired from its satellites. So back in the 90s, uh, the uh, JAXA, which is a Japanese space agency, had a satellite, satellite called JRS-1, and it collected uh, images at L-band. It was an L-band um, radar sensor. And so what the Japanese have done is they've created a global mosaic from JRS-1 for 1996. And it has also created global mosaics from its more recent L-band sensors, which is ALOS Pulsar 1. That goes from 2006, it flew from 2006 to 2011. And then the Pulsar 2, um, which was uh, 2014, I believe, um, and, and it's currently flying, collecting data. So uh, these mosaics can be downloaded for free, and you do need to have an account with JAXA in order to download these mosaics. However, the one that we are interested in is just the JRS one because the ALOS Pulsar mosaics are on Google Earth Engine. Okay, so here's the web page, the JAXA web page. And in addition to the 
mosaics, the backscatter mosaics, they've also generated a product on forest, non-forest. So they've used these mosaics to generate these global forest, non-forest maps, these their yearly global forest, non-forest maps. And they've got a number of updates here um, on the data sets that they've made available. And they talk about the algorithm used to generate the uh, forest, non-forest maps. And so these mosaics are at 25 meter resolution. So in order to download the data, okay, you need to first register yourself. And you go to, down to number four and you click on this link. And you then uh, provide your information and uh, you register yourself and they will send you a confirmation email with your password. Once you have your password, then you go back and you select this link. The data set download site is this one. And so, so that link will take you to this page, okay? So this page contains the different mosaics that are available that you can download. And we've got, again, it's 25 meters, they're global. For JRS1, it's 1996, that's just HH polarization. And then for other years, uh, there's there are mosaics available 2007, 8, 9, 10, and then 15, 16, 17, and 18. Okay, also um, 25 meters. These are HH the, and HV. The radar backscatter mosaics are HH and HV. And then there's also that product that I mentioned that they've generated from these radar backscatter mosaics for not for snaps. Okay. They also have these mosaics that were assembled uh, as part of what was called the Global Rainforest Mapping Project at the time over the tropics. And these mosaics will show you the data that's available, right? So it's the tropics, but it's available for different years, which is uh, quite nice. So you've got 1993, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Okay. And then there are some low resolution products. If you're not needing the 25 meter uh, products, you can download the same data sets at 100 meter resolution and at one kilometer resolution and at 0 0.25 degree as well, the forest, not forest. Um, maps. Okay, so let's download the data set that we're interested in. Now, our area of study will be, or our focus area will be in Myanmar. And this is an area where there's been a lot of mangrove loss. So we will select this grid here. Let's go back. I might have done that too quickly. It's this grid, this one here. And this is all in the PowerPoint. Okay, so once you select that grid, you go to another one. So we will select this area. We're interested in, in this coast right here. Okay, and then we will, sell, we will download five tiles from here. And these are these two, these two, and then this one. So let me just show you in the PowerPoint files, the tiles that we're interested in. So here you go. We will be downloading these five tiles, okay? So you need to download each one, one by one, okay? So you click on the first one and you select download and it will automatically download the file onto your computer. Okay, so once it downloads, you need to 
unzip that file. And the format it's in, it's in an NV format. So that means it's a raw file and then it's got a header file associated with it that has all the metadata uh, relevant to that image. So once that file is downloaded, then what we do is we open the Sentinel toolbox because what we want to do is convert that file from an NV file to a GeoTIFF. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do this with the Sentinel toolbox. You can do it with, for example, uh, QGIS. You, you, QGIS uh, recognizes MB files and you can just export it as a TIFF. So what we'll do is let's just go and open our file. And the way to open that file is you go to um, import generic formats, oops, file import generic formats and select NV. And then I've downloaded the files already and I've unzipped them. And so what I'll do is I'll select the HH, that's the one. So each file, it comes in a folder with um, the main file, which is HH polarization. And then it's got uh, a file that has uh, the, the date, the date of acquisition of each pixel, the incidence angle, and it's got a uh, uh, a mask, so the areas that were masked out when processing the data. Okay, so we import, we select the HDR import and it'll open it. So you click on, you open the, the file name and there are three folders and then you click on, you open bands and double click on band one. So that's the image. And what we want to do is export to you go up to file, export, select GeoTIFF, and then select the name of the file. We'll keep the same name and just add the TIFF uh, um, extension at the end. And then uh, press export. You'll do this with all of the five files because you want to have them as geotiffs, okay? So just make sure that when you load the next file, and so let me just show you here very quickly. Let's load the next file. Just select this one, number two. When you really select the band, okay, it's easy to just kind of open it and then go up here and do the export. And what happens is it's it's actually going to export this one. So select the band and uh, go through the same process: export geotiff. Okay, so that ensures that you're exporting that band. All right, so once you have your files, so we won't need Sentinel, the Sentinel toolbox anymore. That's, that's the only part where we need Sentinel toolbox in this demo. The next thing we do is we go to Google Earth Engine. Okay, so here we are on Google Earth Engine and I've got my code editor here in the middle. And what I do in order to import an image is I go into assets. I click on new, and then you can upload different types of files. You can upload a shape file, we'll do that. Um, you can upload a geotiff file. So let's upload the geotiff files. So I'm in an image pops up, and what you need to do is select your TIFF image. And you have to do this 
for each image, right? So, so let's go and select that that we created, and let's select here a first one. And uploaded them. Code. I'm just going to give it a name, and I'll call it um, JRS uh, first. Okay. First image. And then I click on upload. And if you go here on the right, on the far right, this window asks being uploaded. And it tells you how much has been uploaded. So it, it will give you an idea. This is nice because then you know how long it's going to take to upload your image. All right. So once that finishes, you'll see that there, there are no wheels spinning. Then just go, go to that file, which is the most recent one, and click on that question mark. OK? And then this is the name. And let's click on View Assets. So that when you click on View Assets, then this window opens. And you can see these details about your, your image. So this is the image ID, this one up here. And you can call your image through the uh, using code um, and th using this image ID. Or it's much easier to just import that image. So click here, click on import, and that's it. OK. So let's close E here. And what happens is in your text editor, there is something called imports up here. And what you'll see is the image that you just imported. It's called image. JRS first image. So I'd like to change the name rather than just having it being called image. Um, I always like to use a descriptive name. So this is uh, the JRS uh, first. Okay. And you do the same for all of the images. So you import all of them and so I will, I'm actually going to delete this because I already have the images imported. But let me just show you what I've done here. So under import, I've imported the five images, JRS images, one, two, three, four, and five, right? So I've named them. Uh, I've given them a descriptive name. And then I can call them in the code. The next thing we want to do is we want to upload another file. And this one is on mangrove cover. So, mangro so global mangrove distribution. And this is a file that has been generated by global mangrove watch. By, uh, it's, a, it's a joint project, but it's called the Global Mango Watch uh, product. And you can access it through the link provided on the PDF. So we go to this page, and this page has the Global Mango Watch files, 1996 through 2016. And these are all vector files. The one you're interested in downloading is 2010. So the 2010 file has a baseline of global mangrove distribution. Again, these are vector files. And if you want to learn about how these files were produced, there's more information here and here. But they've used uh, the radar data from JRS and ALOS Pulsar uh, to generate these global distribution mangrove uh, files. Okay. So download this one. 
And then let's upload it into Google Earth Engine. And the way to do that is go to Google Earth Engine, again, select New under Assets, and this time select Shape Files. And it'll be the same process. You drag your shape file into the selection box to select files. You give it a name and then you upload it. Again, the same thing. Um, it'll tell you how long it takes to upload. This one will take a little longer because it's a larger file. So here's what we do. So going to data, it needs at least the SHX, the SHP, and the, the uh, let's see, the DBX, the, the DBF files. Let me just double check on that. So click on these three. Okay, so it needs at least those three. And then you can just rename it. I named it uh, mangrove, mangrove vector. Just name it however you want and go through that process of upload. And then same thing. I, I've already uploaded it, but same thing. You'll have the image appear here under tasks with a cogwheel and it will tell you uh, what percentage of the image has been uploaded. And then once it's uploaded, uh, same thing, you press on the question mark and you go to view assets and you import that file. So now that file will appear in your imports list. And you can see it here in my imports list. I've named that file, actually I've named it mangroves, okay? So it's a mangrove 2010 and I've named it mangroves to identify it. All right. Great. So we've got those files uploaded and a lot of you were asking in the previous demos how you uploaded files. Uh, so this is how you do it. And um, the next step is in loading the Pulsar mosaics. So Google Earth Engine has the Pulsar global mosaics, the yearly mosaics. It also has the forest, non-forest maps. So just type Pulsar up in the search window and click on Pulsar 2 Pulsar yearly mosaic to get information about the, the file. Okay, there you go. So the it tells you that they are HH and HV. And there's the incidence angle information, the date of acquisition, and the uh, uh, processing information. And There's a description, again, it's 25 meters. The data are um, at 16-bit digital numbers. And so you do need to apply a, an equation to convert that DN value into decibels. And we will go through that, okay? So the data have been processed, corrected, they, but they are in digital numbers. So that's, that's one of the things we need to do as well as apply a speckle filter. Okay, and then one more thing is that these data are, there, there are different years. Um, so one thing you can do is import the collection and then filter it according to years. Or what I've done here is I've called the specific years. So what we've done here is load the Pulsar global yearly mosaics, okay? So in this case, uh, there's the 
we're loading the 2007, the 2010, and the 2017 yearly mosaics. And um, they're being called Pauser 2007, 2010, 2017, okay? And then we're also loading the SRTM 30 meter DEM. Again, if you want to see more about the SRTM digital elevation models on Google Earth Engine, this is the one that we selected. And this is the name of that data set. So we're just calling it SRTM. Okay, the next thing is the JRS1 images that we uploaded, those were individual images. So we want to create a mosaic, right? And in order to create a mosaic, we use this command. So we're calling the mosaic JRS1996, and uh, we're using the EE image collection. So we're saying take all of these images, the five images, individual images, and mosaic them. The next thing we need to do, as you know, with radar, is that we need to filter the images. So what we've done is applied the same smoothing filter that's been applied in other uh, demos that we've done. Uh, here we've defined the filter to be 30. It's slightly smaller. You can certainly play around with that. And uh, what we're doing here is just saying, OK, so take the PALSAR 2007 global mosaic, HH and HV, and apply the smoothing filter. And then JRS, it just has one band. It's HH, uh, and apply the smoothing filter. <coughs> All right, so once we do that, then we convert the images into dB. And this is the equation to convert the images into sigma naught in, uh, in dB, in decibels. Okay, so it's the 10 log 10 of the DN number squared plus a calibration factor. The calibration factor is minus 83 for pulsar, for the pulsar mosaics and images, and it's minus 84.66 for the JRS mosaic. So what this is doing is it's applying the, the equation with the specific calibration factor for JRS, and then the same equation, but with the specific calibration factor for the Pulsar mosaics, okay? And we're doing this for both uh, HH and HV, wherever there is HH and HV. Remember, JRS has just HH. All right, the next thing we want to do is we want to define our area of interest. Okay, and the area of interest that we want to define is off the coast of Myanmar. Okay, so so what you do in order to define your region of interest is select the polygon, select the draw shape polygon, and this is what's going to come up. It, the default is is uh, is called geometry. So you draw your area of interest, and here we're drawing an area of interest along the coast here of Myanmar. And then you go in and you change the name of geometry. You change that to, by clicking on that cogwheel, you change it to ROI. So that means region of interest, okay? I've done that already. So this is, I'm just gonna delete this.
I've done that already here. This is my region of interest. All right. So once we select an, a region of interest, then we want to clip the images to our region of interest, our area of interest. Uh, because remember, these images are global. All right. So we go ahead and we do a clipping according to that region of interest that we define. So we're taking the DB images that we created in the previous step here, DB for each of the images. And we use this clip command according to the region of interest. So we're clipping it according to the region of interest and we're calling those new images um, ROI. So the same name and then we're adding ROI at the end. All right. And the other thing that we're doing is we're also clipping the SRTM uh, elevation image. So that's a, a global product, the, the SRTM elevation image. And so we are clipping it according to the ROI and we're calling it SRTM region of interest. Okay, so once that's done, then you need to add those images to layers in order to be able to visualize them. So let's just go ahead and um, let's add them. So we're adding all of them, the SRTM ROI. And so we're stretching the values here just to visualize it. This is all um, trial and error. Um, just this is, you, you wanna find the best stretch to, to visualize your image. Um, so SRTM ROI and it's called SRTM in the layers. And then we're taking that vector, that mangroves vector, that is a global vector, and we're adding it to layers as well. And we say, okay, give it a red color. So we're just calling it mangroves. And then we're adding each of our images to the layers bar. Um, again, we're stretching according to the, uh, the the values in the image, and this is this is trial and error. You, you can play around with this until you find a stretch that, that best allows you to visualize the image. But in this case, for uh, HV, we're using a stretch of minus 27 to minus 5, and for HH, minus 15 to minus 3, and then for JRS, minus 25 to 0. All right, and then one thing that uh, we've done here also at the end has been to create some RGB images. So there are three RGB images. Um, there is the, there is the, let's see, the image, the first one is looking at the difference between 2007 and 2017 only. Okay, so we're using the H band to look at 2007, which is in the red and blue bands, and then we put 2017 in the green band. The second RGB, we're visualizing, we're doing a, a RGB between 1996 and 2017. So the 1996 image is in the red and blue bands, and the 2017 is in the green band. And then finally, the last RGB is the three different dates, the Pulsar dates. That's 2007, 2010, and 2017. All right. So let's just run that. And let's take a look at our images. And this is, and, and you can just deselect that ROI because it's kind of, it's going to get in the way when you want to visualize the images. So, so the images we loaded are so let's start. Let's start with SRTM. 
Okay, that's our elevation file. This is our mangroves vector file. Now this is a global file. Okay, so that's the mangrove vector, the, the global distribution. This is our JRS file, mosaic that we created, 1996. And then this is Pulsar 2007, Pulsar 2010, and Pulsar 2017. All right, so really to visualize those, let's upload the RGB. So this is 2007 and 2017. So remember, anything that is pink means that it was high in 2007, low in 2017, because pink is a combination of red and blue, which is what we have in the 2007 channel. And let's just zoom in so you can really see uh, the amount of change that has occurred here in this area. So this is between 2007 and 2017. All of the pink areas are areas where there's been loss, mangrove loss. And the green areas has been, is, is either there's been a regeneration of the mangrove. So it was, uh, it had been cut in 2007 and it grew in 2017. Either that, or it could also be that there is the, some, sometimes these are cut and used for agriculture. So there is some, um, some, some agricultural crop in these fields. It doesn't necessarily mean the green areas that there's been a return in the mangroves. Now, let's visualize the the three dates, the 2007, 2010, and 2017. So remember that color wheel that, that we discussed back in the time series uh, um, webinar on the combination of colors to understand the, the change in different dates. Okay. So anything that is yellow would mean that there is a mix of green and red. And so whatever's in the green channel and whatever's in the red channel is high. And whatever's in the blue channel is low. Anything that is green means that only whatever's in the green channel is high. Um, okay, so now let's display the 1996 and 2017. Let me select this. So all of the pink areas are areas where there was loss between mangrove loss between 1996 and 2017. There is a slight offset. When you zoom in, you'll, you'll see that there's a slight offset. So the co-registration is not perfect. 
But there are some interesting things that are quite obvious. For example, uh, there has been uh, an extension of the land right here in this snippet. And down here as well. in this area. So this uh, 1996 JRS uh, mosaic is really a, a great mosaic if you want to go back and look at some uh, changes, uh, historic changes, you know, especially being able to compare it with uh, very recent data. The only thing about this mosaic is that it's an, it's just an HH polarization. And one thing I'm not sure I mentioned, but the JRS mosaics that I showed you how to upload, as well as the mangrove distribution files, are on the RCEP webpage. So you can grab them from there rather than um, going in and, and downloading them through the, the uh, directly from the web pages I showed you. All right. So now that we've visualized the images, let's let's look at some changes. And what we're going to do here is do something similar to what we did in the uh, time series analysis on the first webinar. So we are going to create these ratio images. And here we're creating ratio images for two different dates. One is 2007 to 2017. And for that, we're using the HB channel. And the other ratio image is 1996 and 2017. We're using HH. Uh, you will notice that there is a subtract here. The reason for that is because remember these images are in, in their log. Um, so whenever you do a division with numbers that are log, you subtract them. Okay, so let's calculate the ratio images and then display them and run your code. So you can see them here in the bar. So you've got the 2007, 2017. Let's just look at that. So the areas that are very bright are areas where there's been loss in mangrove. And the areas that are very dark are areas where there's been some sort of return of vegetation. So that is for 2007-2017. Let's take a look at the 1996-2017. You see that there was, there, there's been quite a bit of change there in that time period. Okay. So the next thing we do is calculate the threshold that we're going to apply. And this time we'll do it a little differently. So last time what we did was we looked at the histogram and then based on the standard deviation, we multiplied the uh, standard deviation by 1.5 and we calculated the threshold based on um, 
the mean minus 1.5. Okay, so what we're going to do here is draw polygons over the areas of change to determine our thresholds. So let's just bring up the HV 2007-2017. Okay, so what you do is you go to the polygon shape here and you select the draw shape Let's deselect ROI and select new layer. And then zoom in to those bright areas. So what we want to do is we want to select some polygons and then determine the statistics of the values within those polygons to then set our threshold. So let's just select this area here. So you get the point. All right, so now what we'll do is go into geometry and just give that a name. So what I've done as has been to give this a name and call it loss. So these are areas where there was mangrove loss 2007-2017. Okay, and press OK. Now, repeat that. So since I've done this, I'm not going to save it. I've got it right here. Now repeat that for the areas where there's been a, a gain. So select those polygons over those very dark areas. And then also select over areas where there's no change. There's no mangrove change. And those are the areas where it's not either dark or bright. And another way to do that is to overlay that mangrove vector file. So let's just overlay the mangrove vector file on this ratio image. Okay, so you can overlay it using the, the tool here next to the, the file name. So there we're overlaying just to make sure that wherever you pick an area that you want to characterize as no change, that it actually falls within the mangrove vector file. And this is also a good way to um, look at the areas that are defined as mangrove uh, by the vector file. So, so you can select an area here. Again, you select the polygon, say new layer, and then zoom in. So 
select that area. Oops. Apologize, I selected line. We actually want a polygon. So let's make sure we select polygon. Okay. And then So you can see as you overlay this mangrove vector file that this, this is from 2010, right? And there have been changes in the mangrove cover in this area, right, from 2010. Those bright areas are areas where there's been mangrove loss. Okay, and then name your uh, polygon appropriately. So what I've done is I've created six different categories, right? Um, so one is called, or, or call them classes. Uh, so one is called loss 2007-2017. Gain 2007, 2017, and then no change 2007, 2017. That's the last one I selected. Now, you want to go through that same process, just upload the 1996, 19, uh, 1996, 2017 ratio image, and do the same thing. Select areas where it's bright. There were actually not very many dark areas. And I will deselect. So these are the areas I selected. So the areas that are purple are areas that I that are bright. That means there was a mangrove loss. The areas that are yellow means that there was some sort of gain. And then no change are areas that are cyan. And when you overlay that mangrove vector layer, you can see how much change there's been since 2000, uh, uh, since 1996. Okay. So we've got our polygon selected. Now we want to extract the statistics of those polygons. And the first thing we do is we generate something, a variable called reducers. And that reducers, it combines the statistics that we want to calculate for the polygons. So it combines mean and standard deviation. And then what we do is we compute the mean and standard deviation for each of our polygon classes. So for loss 2007, 2017, I think we selected six polygons. So basically it's computing the statistics for the pixels in all of those six polygons that have been labeled as loss 2007, 2017. Okay, and we've done that uh, for, for each one. So we've got six of these statistics that we're computing. And then we are printing the results to our console window here. And so what we're saying in this print statement is um, print out the mean and standard deviation for loss 2007, 2017. And so here's the statistics for that. And we've done that for each one, each of the six, one, six uh, polygon uh, classes. Okay, so once you run it, you go to the console and
you can see here then that the for 2007-2017, the pixels in the polygons that were labeled as loss, the mean is 15 and the standard deviation is 2.28, okay? Then for gain and for no change, we're not get, gonna use these, but this is just a reference of what the values are for, for no change. And then the same thing, the statistics down here are for 1996. All right, so what we do is we take those statistics to set the limits for the thresholds that we're gonna apply. And uh, so we've got um, two thresholds. We, we've got a, a loss and then we've got a gain threshold for the 2007, 2017 and 1996 and 2017. So how do we set these thresholds? We basically took the mean. So in this case, for loss, we took the mean, looked at the mean, it's 15, looked at the standard deviation, it's 2.2. So we multiplied that standard deviation times two and then subtracted that from the mean. So that, that came up to, and, and we, we rounded um, some numbers here, but that came up to 10.4. Okay, and then we did the same thing for the for gain and the same thing then for the 1996 gain and loss. There is something different that we did here for the the gain in 1996. The it was quite uh, large the standard deviation. And so instead of setting that standard deviation multiplying it times two and this was all done by trial and error uh, we multiplied it by uh, around one and a half to set the threshold for gain all right so then we've created these masks that we display and so you 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 save and you run And then we've got the results here, what we're displaying, let's just go back. So we're displaying loss 2007, 2017, labeled as vegetation loss, vegetation gain, and then loss 96, 2017 and gain. So these are our images. So let's look at loss 2000 and we're displaying it as the color red. So these are just the pixels where there's loss. What we can do is just overlay the image. So let's overlay the, in this case, the Pulsar HV 2017 image to show the areas that are being identified as lost. In fact, let's better yet even let's just overlay the the that different that ratio image. So these are the areas identified as areas where there's been loss, okay? We are missing out on, on some of the, the, the bright um, pixels when you overlay these on the difference image. And uh, what you can do is you can um, just decrease that threshold. So instead of using 10.4, maybe try 10.2. 
Okay, so let's just run this again and try 10.0 and see how that looks. Okay, so we're selecting more of those brighter pixels, but there might also be more noise. You see over here, there's some, some, some noise. And, and so um, setting these thresholds really does require some level of um, trial and error. All right, so let's take a look at the 1996 and the vegetation loss for 1996. So there's a lot that being, that's being selected here. Okay, so the next step here is to Let's clip those radar images and elevation to the mangrove vector file. And the way you do that is you select, what we're gonna do in this case is we're gonna select the original unclipped file. And, and there's a reason for this that I wanna show you in the next step. So the original unclipped file, so this is the global mosaic of 2007 HH, HB or and, and 2017 and 1996. I'm gonna clip it here uh, according to the areas where there's mangrove coverage, okay? And then this file is being called mangroves 2007 um, HH. So all of the files that are called mangroves um, are the clipped files. And then we'll add those to the layers bar. So if you hit run, let's deselect this so you've got these mangrove files where we're just we're extracting the the backscatter only over the areas where the vector file is indicating that they're mangroves Okay, so since this is global, it might uh, take a little while. But here you have the backscatter for the different years and polarizations of the areas where the mangrove uh, vector file indicates that there's, at, at least as of 2010, that there was a uh, there were mangroves there. So we can just pan around here a little bit. A uh, huge um, mangrove region here, obviously. Bangladesh. And so the next thing I'm going to do is show you how to calculate above ground biomass.
Yeah, so there might also be a, a little more noise uh, when you low, lower that threshold. So the next and final step I want to share with you is calculating above ground biomass of mangrove ecosystems. And there is a relationship between canopy height and mangrove biomass. And there's been work done uh, by a number of people, uh, Mark Simard, Richard Lucas, Sasan Saachi, Lola Fatunjimbo, on, on um, establishing these relationships. They've done uh, a lot of uh, collection uh, measurements in situ to establish these relationships between biomass and canopy height and develop uh, allometric equations. So in terms of using, what we'll do is we'll use the SRTM-DM because that provides an assessment of canopy height. And you're thinking, well, how, yeah, how does it do it? Well, SRTM, uh, the, the wavelength did not, that DM is using a, a wavelength that did not completely penetrate through the vegetation. So uh, what we're seeing actually in the SRTM DM is a uh, is 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 vegetation height in some places where the signal is not penetrating all the way through, and so that is the case in uh, in in mangrove ecosystems. That signal is not reaching the ground; it is penetrating somewhat through the canopy, and it's been established that the uh, the that, that that level of penetration in on a general basis, right? So the maximum height is generally 1.6 times the um, the SR, SRTM elevation. So what SRTM really is measuring is the basal area weighted height. That's also called Lori's height. So there's an assessment of the, the actual elevation of um, mangroves with SRTM. And since we know that these areas are flat wherever you find mangroves, uh, because they are lying along the coast, you don't have the problem of like uh, finding them in, in mountains or, or hills or additional topography, then you can assume that SR, the SRTM DM was what that's telling you in areas along the coast is actually the height of the mangroves. Um, so there's an equation here in this web page, in this uh, PowerPoint, that shows the relationship between above ground biomass and canopy uh, height. And, and so, so we're using the basal area weighted height which is 1.08 times the SRTM elevation. And we apply this formula. So let's go back to the Google Earth Engine. And so here we have the backscatter DM. So here we're looking at the clipped, uh, uh, the, the clipped backscatter for global mangrove ecosystems. So what we did is we took the DB image and we clipped it according to that mangroves vector file. So now we've got the, the backscatter only for mangrove ecosystems globally. Okay. And you'll notice that in the code, I also, I have two parts. One I left uh, comment, commented out, but you can change this. So I have either the clipped if you want to see just backscatter for the mangrove areas, or it's unclipped. Um, so if you want to see the mosaic for the entire globe, and then you can overlay the mangrove vector file. So let me just show you. Right now, the way it is, you're, we're clipping all of the uh, images to the mangrove file. Okay. So. If you want to see the, the the file for the entire globe, oh, 
Okay, so then it's mis it's mislabeled. But if if you just want to see, you know, the entire mosaic, and then you want to overlay the mangrove vector file, you do this. And it might take a little bit to, to load. So there, so there, if you want to do that instead, you can. But in this case, I've clipped it. And let's just go back to what I showed, the clipped one. Okay, so to calculate um, biomass, you use this equation, the one you just saw in the PowerPoint, and this is how you write that equation. So it's taken that elevation and it's um, it's multiplying it by 1.08, raising it to power of 1.53 times 3.25, okay? And so let's just run this and we can see some of the results, okay? So now what we're running is the clipped. So first of all, let's just load elevation. And there's some interesting um, mangrove ecosystems around the world. Obviously, that there's the Sundarbans here, uh, but if you go to Gabon, there's some very high mangroves in Gabon. Let me just zoom out. So here near Liberville, you've got some very high mangrove ecosystems. And we load the elevation so you can see. So it's right here. So this is the elevation file for those areas. And if you want to see the value of elevation, just click on, go to inspector and click on an area. And you'll see that you'll see the elevation value. So you'll see the value for that file. Let's see. I must be clicking on the wrong area here. Okay, so here, that pixel I clicked on, it says it's three meters, and then the biomass is, is the, it's 19 tons per hectare, okay? Um, if we click on an, another area where the vegetation is higher than you have an elevation of 49 meters, biomass is much higher. All right, so you can generate this and this will give you just a general assessment of biomass um, for mangrove ecosystems. Now there is a caveat with this because in some places the elevation might be zero, it might be showing zero or it might be showing like minus one. So there you have to take the absolute value because uh, it, it, you're not going to get a, a number a biomass, above ground biomass value if your elevation is negative. So you have to uh, convert it into absolute values. Okay, but that gives you a, a, a nice general assessment of, of biomass. 
All right, so with that, uh, I, this demo uh, concludes and now we will open it up to your uh, questions. And I see a lot of questions have been coming in already through the chat. Okay, first question. Would the methodology be the same for wetlands? Um, yes, you can use the same methodology for wetlands. Now, the difference with mangrove ecosystems is that it's not as straightforward because mangrove ecosystems, remember, they're a mix of like inundated vegetation. It depends if the tide is high or low and non-inundated vegetation. The structure is, is very different than a regular forest. So the thing about um, mangrove ecosystems is that um, you usually have, like in forests, you usually have an increase in backscatter as the vegetation biomass increases, okay? Until there's a point where that signal just saturates. It doesn't increase anymore. It just, it doesn't, um, it, it just reaches a certain level. And, and so the higher the backscatter, you kind of assume that the higher the vegetation biomass. For mangrove ecosystems, it's, it's different. The backscatter will increase up to a certain point as, as the uh, biomass of the mangroves increases up to a certain point. And from that point on, it actually decreases because the signal just gets attenuated. It has to do with that, that um, the structure of these ecosystems. So that signal gets attenuated and you might have like high uh, density high biomass mangrove ecosystems that have low backscatter. But then again, in mangrove ecosystems, you might have um, sparse or, or low density mangroves where the signal is penetrating and you're getting that double bonds component and you're getting just a very high backscatter. So, so, uh, so mangrove ecosystems tend to be a little uh, tricky with wetland ecosystems, you can apply the same methodology um, in terms of doing a threshold or even running a classification as we did in the second session. So it, it's much more straightforward actually in wetland ecosystems. If you see a, a high bright backscatter, you know that uh, that wetland is inundated. This is These are inland wetlands. Is it suitable to use Sentinel-1 to assess flooding areas and or tree height within the urban environment? Oof. Yeah, so the thing about using, first of all, Sentinel-1 is not gonna penetrate as much through vegetation. So it's a little more challenging to look at flooded areas where there's dense vegetation. You're just not gonna pick it up because that signal is not penetrating through the vegetation canopy. Um, in flooded areas though, I think I'm trying, so there are two types of flooding, right? So there's, if, from the radar perspective, there's the flooded in, uh, vegetation, and then there's just open water, just puddled water without any vegetation. Um, so you could uh, uh, pick up puddled water in urban areas. Um, flooded vegetation, you could pick it up too. It's just a little more challenging because in urban areas, that same backscatter mechanism for flooded vegetation is also the same one for urban areas, right? So you've got double bounce dominating in urban areas. You've got double bounce dominating in flooded vegetation. Is it suitable to use Sentinel-1 to assess flooding areas and or tree height? So tree height, um, I, again, probably not in urban areas, uh, just because it's so sparse, you might be able to use it in areas where there's vegetation. And then again, if you're estimating biomass with Sentinel-1, you really, it, it'll probably it just um, work in areas with low, or low vegetation, not in forests or it won't work as well in forests. How pole insar and tomosar, this is question number three, work in tree height estimation? Okay, uh, that's a great question. I think someone is getting ahead of themselves here because uh, if you wait until Thursday, 
you will learn about this. Uh, there is the a session on Thursday. It's focused on estimating tree height. Okay, so don't miss that one. On the slide 20, why are there two HH in the three band composite image? Is one of the HH L band and the other P band? Let me quickly take a look at slide 20. Okay, yeah, so the reason there are um, two HH is because we're looking at an image from one date, right? And so we're we have two bands, HH and HV. This is ALOS pulsar. And you, I'm creating an RGB, right? So I need to put something in the third band. And you can, in this case, I've put the same polarization in two bands, in a band and the first R, the, the red and the blue. But you can put, say in the blue, you can also do a ratio of the bands, HH over HV, and put that in the, in the blue band. Um, I just, uh, uh, just use this combination, HH, HV, HH, uh, just so that you can, uh, just for visualization, and so you can understand really the unique information content in each of the polarizations. But these are images from the same date. Okay, next question. How do you come up with the table in slide 23? So let's, yeah, so this is a table. Uh, this is coming from a, a great resource online. It's called the Severe Handbook. And this handbook contains chapters on, uh, on different applications of SAR. And one chapter is focused on mangroves. This was uh, led by Mark Simard. And he has this table in here, and he assembled this table from uh, his uh, publications uh, and uh, measurements in the field, as well as that from others that have been doing uh, the, um, using radar to uh, measure mangroves for a very long time. Okay. Six, if we look at the concept of antenna pattern, then is it right that in a given swath of a homogeneous land cover, the mid range of the illuminated swath have lightly higher backscatter values than the near range and far range will have the least when compared to the mid and area? Um, yes, actually, but this should be corrected when you apply the, the, the processing, the correction. So you do have an antenna pattern and it looks like an umbrella. And so what you do to remove that through an algorithm is you take a homogeneous area, say a forest that goes you know, uh, uh, homogeneous across the image horizontally. And so you take the backscatter and you see how that varies. As I said, it's like a curve, right? And so then you apply the inverse of that curve to correct for that antenna pattern, but that should be corrected. And usually um, the, the antenna, the, the variations in antenna pattern, it depends on the data set. Um, but usually the, they're small. But if you want to really see if there's any anything related to uh, antenna pattern, um, you can just do what I just said. Just just uh, look at uh, the pixel variation across the image over a homogeneous area. Okay. So is it possible to access Google Earth Engine, Google Earth Images, as well as as well in Google Earth Engine for validation purposes while performing your classification? If yes, what code should we use? I, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I have never tried that. So this would be a matter of uh, looking to see what's been done and if so, how, how it's been done. But I agree um, that um, having this sort of capability would really facilitate things in terms of just loading an, an, an image uh, rather than having to put it in your code and, and visualizing, just, just bringing it up like with a Google Earth um, interface. Question eight, JAXA's officials said in late 2019 that they will make the ALOS 2 data free. Is there an update on that? Great point. 
Not that I know of. As of today, not that I know of. But yes, they have said that they will make the ALOS 2 data free. And that is going to be huge because it is L-band data. It is global data. And I, I think it would be just a, an amazing data set to have in addition to Sentinel-1. Question nine, can SAR predict mangrove as healthy or damaged? Um, I'm, so I'm trying to think what healthy means. Say, say you have a change in colors in, in the mangrove. So I know sometimes there are mangrove die-offs and, and they just change, they just turn brown. You're not, not going to detect that because remember, radar is sensitive to structure and and moisture, right? So um, with optical, you can see those differences in color, uh, but you might be able to detect if there's been a degradation in the mangrove because of, say, the huge amounts of leaf loss, right? Or um, in terms of damage, if there's been a degradation of the mangrove through logging, you might be able to see those changes with the radar. To perform a land cover classification using Sentinel-1 and Landsat-8, for example, is it 20 samples of approximately 1,000 square meters of ground truth too little? Oh, so 20 samples. So let me see. No, I think that that would be fine. And what you can do really, if you're not certain, if you have enough uh, ground truth is cut that out, you know, cut a third out and run your, your uh, ground truth and, and see how your results end up. And then add those other, at at the part that you didn't cut out and see what the results are. And if they change significantly, then um, you, you, you don't have uh, enough points. Question 11, I'm finding that SNAP creates a bunch of large size temp files that quickly clog up the hard drive. Is there a way to automatically flush these temp files after a project? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, I feel your pain because I've, I've run into this before and there might be a way in the preferences. The best way to figure this out is there is a forum on uh, Sentinel Toolbox where people post their questions and uh, usually, uh, there's an answer there already for for what you have in mind. So it it it's good to um, to visit that forum and see if uh, someone has has had this issue already and if their question has been answered. Question twelve: Is it possible to map the loss force between 2010 and 2020? Is it necessary? to resample the Sentinel-1 from 10 meters to 25 meters to be compatible with Pulsar-1. Yeah, okay. So the thing about using two different bands is that they are, they have different wavelengths, right? So you are gonna get slightly different information. Uh, if, if you're looking at deforestation, you're probably, you're, you're going to see that, you know, if an area has been cleared, if there was mangrove there and there is no mangrove now. Um, but you don't, I think the best approach here when you're using radar images with two different bands is, um, it, it's just keep in mind that the, the information content is, is different is slightly different because of that penetration capability. Question 13, are there any constraints with respect to storage size restrictions for uploading files? Uh, I, I think there are, yes. Uh, I'll ha I'd have to go back and look and see what those constraints are. 
So there are a lot of forms online for Google Earth Engine. I mean, there are a lot of people that are using Google Earth Engine for analysis. And uh, there, there's uh, uh, people that post questions or the forums where people post questions and, and they get answered. So you might want to uh, do these sort of searches and, and see if your, um, your queries are resolved. Why not use, question 14, why not, not use ALO's World 3D, 30D um, instead of the SRTM since we're using the ALO's Pulsar or is it not available in Google Earth Engine? Um, so the ALO's World 3D, the, um, you can try that too. Now, let me see. One thing is we calculated biomass at the end, right? So that equation has been derived based on um, C-band actually. So, so SRTM used um, C-band. And so it's, base, it's derived based on the penetration depth of the SRTM signal into the vegetation. If you use a DM that was derived using a, a wavelength that's longer, so I, I'd have to look at the, uh, okay, so it looks like, okay, so the ALOS DSM Global 3D um, meter DM is derived using a stereo pair of optical images. Okay, yeah, so you can certainly use this. You, you just need to, figure out what is the, uh, that allometric equation needs to be modified because that signal, if it's using optical images, that signal is not penetrating through the vegetation up to a certain point. It's just seeing the tops. And so that equation needs to be modified accordingly. All right, next question. Can we use this tool, Pulsar Mosaic, to analyze other vegetation types, not only mangrove or other forest plants. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, you can use it. Uh, it. It is a great resource. The only thing about the Pulsar Mosaic is that if you're looking at things that are dynamic, if you're looking at like at wetland inundation dynamics or um, other things that might be dynamic, if you want to look at like the scar of a fire, a recent fire, then you're going to lose that sort of information in a global mosaic. And it will be important to read in that date file that's associated with the mosaic just to know the date that your, um, that, uh, the, the, the date for each pixel. Question 16, why do we use gamma naught here, but we use sentinel sigma naught previously? Is one better, more appropriate than the other? How do you make this decision? Finally, could you explain a bit more about beta naught, gamma naught, and sigma naught? Mm. So we're not using gamma naught here. Let me double double check. So these images, are, I'll have to go back and double check. I don't think this is gamma naught. These are um, sigma naught, and they are expressed as just digital numbers, which we are converting into into dB. but I need to double check that. All right. If you send me an email, I, I'd be happy to, uh, to clarify this. Why, question 17, why did you first convert the images to DB and only after that clip them? Would it be faster to clip them first and convert later? Yeah, absolutely. The reason I did that was because at the end, I wanted to show you 
uh, how you can look at mangroves globally and how you can uh, use that vector file to clip the entire global mosaic and 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 just look at backscatter over the mangrove areas but yeah if you don't want to look at any other place just clip it from the beginning question 18 how do i know which range is best for starch image why min 5 max 40 Okay, I'm not sure what is meant here by starch image, but I'm going back to the code and looking at five and 40. So that's the SRTM, uh, that's the SRTM elevation. And the reason I just stretched it, this is just for visualization. This has nothing to do with analysis. I just stretched it so I could see well that variation in the coast, which is, it's very um, subtle, right? So if you're looking at, it, it's just a couple of meters along the coast. So I just stretched it and uh, to that range. Question 19, with regard to exporting the final map, the map has to have the basic elements of a map such as north, arrow, grid, scale bar, and legend. So how do we export our final map with the mentioned basic elements? So there is a code to do this. And um, if you send me an email, I'd be happy to um, share the code with you. I don't have it uh, just accessible with me at the moment. I, I do need to kind of put it together, but uh, there are ways to export the image. So in the previous, in the last um, of webinar, there is a command there at the end that exports the image. You can export it as a geotiff, but um, I know there are ways to add additional things like a, a scale and all of that color bar. Okay, question 20. Is it possible to repeat all these steps using only the SNAP toolbox? So that's a, a great question. I think it would because a SNAP toolbox uh, can also deal with vector files. And the only thing about using the SNAP toolbox is that you have to download these images to your desktop. Um, you need to download the mosaics, you need to cut them. Um, so it's just a little more cumbersome, but I believe you can do all of this. You can do band math on, on the SNAP toolbox. Do we have, question 21, do we have to be concerned about the coordinate system or the projection or shape before we load it to Google Earth? And is there any adjustment we are supposed to do for the shape file for a particular region? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, I believe Google Earth Engine takes this into account to match the position of the different pixels, even though they might be in different projections. So as far as I know, there isn't any adjustments. Now, you saw that the JRS uh, image had a slight offset from the Sentinel, uh, from the uh, Pulsar image. Um, and that has to do just with the, the, uh, the, the geolocation of, of the JRS image. And uh, you could correct for that, I, I just, I, I don't know how it would be done on Google Earth Engine, but there are ways to correct for it say with a software like Envy by using control points and then stretching the image. Question 22. I think the backscattering of mangroves is similar to other vegetations with similar canopy. If so, how do we map a particular vegetation separately? Are there any criteria used to distinguish the different vegetation types? Okay, so it's not clear to me whether this person is referring to different veget mangrove vegetations or different types of uh, just inland vegetation. So you could, um, you can use radar to separate different types of vegetation. Polarimetry really helps. That's when the more polarizations you have, the, the, the better you can do this, okay? Because um, you're, 
basically classifying things according to structure. So assuming that different vegetation types have different structure, then uh, you, can, you can separate them. Question 23, you mentioned that the co-registration of the images is not perfect. Okay. We, there, were there ways to correct this or is this office so small and systematic that it is not necessary to correct? Yeah, well, it, it, is, um, it is very small. And when you run, when you apply a threshold or you run a classification, uh, you, you know, even if you run a classification with the JRS and, and ALOS Pulsar images together, you're going to see this offset. Or if you have classification results and you're comparing things, you're going to see this offset. Um, there might be ways to deal with it. So maybe like, in, in coastal areas, uh, you, you apply a, a, a mask to to, um, to to just mask out those coastal areas. Um, so it's not a super big deal. Like you can still see the change, for example. But uh, there the, there will be issues when when you're doing. Uh, some analysis with them that you need to deal with. You can correct it if, uh, I'm not sure how you would correct it, say in the Sentinel toolbox, but I do know with Envy, what you do to correct these type of things is you choose these control points. So you, you select the same point in, in each, in two, in two images, you select the same point and you select points around the image and then basically you do, you stretch one image to the other so that it, it fits um, over one over the other. And um, yeah, it can be a little cumbersome though. It can take some time to do this. T question 24, how can you obtain metrics from the ratio step? For example, how can you quantitatively determine the percentage gain lost in biomass from 2007 to 2017? Okay, this is a good point. I didn't show this here, but in the previous, um, in the in the first uh, 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 webinar that we had for this series, I showed how to determine statistics. So basically, what you what you do is you create a polygon over the area where you want to determine statistics, or say just apply that mangrove. Um, the, the mangrove vector file, um, however you want to do it. And then uh, you can calculate the statistics for the area within that vector file or within that polygon that you drew. Remember to check when you select an area, it has to be a polygon, not the line. Otherwise, if you select the line, uh, you calculate the statistics of pixels that touch the line. You need to select the polygon to calculate the statistics of the pixels falling inside that polygon. Okay. Question 25. Can I apply the same techniques to riparian vegetation mapping? Uh, yes, you would be able to apply a similar technique to riparian vegetation mapping, yes. Now, that's a little different because if you're here, we're looking at change, right? So, so we're looking at that large change in the signal and, and that's why we're setting a threshold. Now, if you wanna do mapping of vegetation, well, you wanna run a classifier and that would be more relevant to the second uh, webinar that we did where uh, we used optical and radar. So you can just try running a classification on just using the radar data but make sure that you have good ground truth to classify your classifier, to select your training areas. Ooh, question 26, which sensor would you recommend for mapping coral reefs? Deep water coral excluded. Yeah, that is a little bit outside of the scope of my expertise. Um, I, I don't look at coral reefs, um, obviously, you you want some sort of optical sensor, and I know that there have been studies um, doing this type of thing. So, 
you need to it's i think it this requires a little bit of research to see what's been done out there but um jpl the, the the nasa center where i work they had a very large project in using an airborne sensor to map um, coral reefs benthic cover Question 27, can I use Earth Engine to download the data in net CDF format? Uh, I believe you do have the option of downloading the data as net CDF, but um, yeah, it's something that I, I'd have to double check. Wouldn't it be better to use the Pulsar DM that has a higher resolution than the SRTM DM? Yeah, possibly. I. The, the Pulsar DM, I don't know what the characteristics are of that DM and whether it's global. Um, and then when you're applying that biomass equation, um, it, it should have the same characteristics as SRTM. Otherwise that equation needs to be modified. How do we define the formula to find the threshold loss and gain? So what we're doing here, th there is a little bit of uh, trial and error in sending in setting these thresholds, right? So you kind of start out with just something general that you applied. In this case, we applied, we set times two, okay? So take the standard deviation times two and then sub subtract that from the mean. And you take a look at your results. And you might have to change that slightly, the, the, the threshold slightly, um, depending on your results. Question 30, it seems like it could be problematic to manually grab the values and calculate your thresholds. Can we access the mean standard deviation objects within the stats filters to calculate thresholds using a function? Yeah, absolutely, this is a great point. Um, I just wanted to go through the steps and and have people um, just understand what the values are and, and how to calculate these. But absolutely, you can just automate this and take that mean and standard deviation that were calculated and put them into a function where uh, you're setting these thresholds directly. Question 31, do you expect the area of loss of mangroves identified are due to human activity or are these areas lower elevations and have been affected by a modest rise in sea level? Yeah, that's a great point. You know, in some areas, uh, I, I think probably 99% of these areas have been lost due to human activity. I mean, they're they're inland. You would it, not they're inland, but they're, they're kind of. Um, a little bit in you go in a little bit right so if you want to take a look at um, loss due to sea level rise um, you would have to uh, let me see what's the best way to do that is first start with an area that you know there's been loss to uh, sea level rise and see how that looks one of the things i did here is i brought up google earth and I looked at this area and it was obvious that these are all areas that have been converted to um, farmlands or aquaculture. I mean, the, 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 the human imprint is clear. They're very geometrical structures. So you wanna take a look at uh, what's the impact of sea level rise. Um, maybe off the, the Gulf Coast, you, you'll see some, um, not only effects of sea level rise, but also um, the subsidence of the land. 32, can the same method be applied in grasslands and shrublands? If yes, what do we need to change apart from the study area in terms of, of theory? Okay, so if you're looking at grasslands and shrublands, first of all, you will want to use Sentinel-1 because that is C-band and that will be more sensitive to um, grasses and, and shrubs, okay? And 
let's see. You want to understand what are the signal characteristics for each. So if you want to classify grasses and shrubs, you don't use a threshold. You, you want to use a classifier. You want to train classes. Okay. But I think the main thing here is you want to use Sentinel-1. Question 33, rather than apply thresholds, might an unsupervised classification be better with say 10 classes or so? Okay, so uh, I'm not sure an unsupervised classification will be better. You might want to try it. I mean, all of these things, part of this is exploring what works better. Right. So, so the main point here is we're looking at change, right? So you want to be able to, whatever method you're, you're using is that you're capturing that dramatic change between um, two different images from different dates. Can these biomass calculation methods be for mangroves be used for terrestrial forest ecosystems? There is something similar for terrestrial forest ecosystems. And in fact, this one is, was based on just the canopy height. Um, there are equations. There's been a lot of work by Saachi, for example, on forest biomass estimation. If you go to that Servier handbook, and you might just want to Google it, do a Google search for a severe SAR handbook. Uh, there is a whole chapter on forest biomass estimation, and there is a tutorial associated with that, so you can um, follow that or, or replicate that tutorial to um, understand how forest biomass is, is calculated. But um, there is a relationship between, as I mentioned, radar backscatter and, and biomass, and so that's what those methods are primarily based on. And uh, you need a lot of uh, ground data and, and uh, develop uh, some allometric equations in order to, to do those estimates. How accurate are these data to use in commercial projects? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think the accuracy is going to depend on on the area. Obviously, we're using, first of all, uh, a mangrove. And I'm assuming you're talking about the, the above ground biomass. So we're using a, a mangrove vector file in this case from 2010. You want to make sure that um, whatever you're assessing is is accurate right so you want to update whatever that vector file is indicating in terms of the presence of mangroves with what's current there might have been mangroves that were cut since uh, 2010 and then uh, make sure that the biomass is um, relates to whether there was a mangrove there or not Right, so SRTM, remember, that was back from 2000, uh, 2000 as well. So how accurate is it to actual biomass? Um, that is, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, there are papers that have been published on the accuracy of these products, and I think the best thing is to refer to them. Simard et al. have published a lot on this. Question 36. Hi, can we use Sentinel C-band for above ground biomass estimation in a dense canopy forest? Oh, no, that, that wouldn't be a good band because um, you, you, you don't have much penetration in a dense canopy forest. You want to use L-band. Question 37. What is the difference when using ascending or descending orbits in SAR time series analysis? So the, your geometry is going to look a little different um, if it's an ascending orbit or descending. So when you're doing time series analysis, you want to 
as with any like classification, you want to just use or ascending or descending in your analysis. And you can do two separate analysis and just compare the results, but you want to just keep to one or the other. Is there an automated way to correct the offset of the images from different years? I don't know of an automated way. There might be, but I don't know. Question turning out, how can you decide scale in the calculation of the statistics of a polygon? So the scale would represent the resolution of the image. So basically you're taking all of the pixels within all of the polygons labeled as loss, for example, um, at the original um, resolution of the image. Question 40. How do we know we need to multiply the standard deviation by two or by 1.5 to define the threshold? Is there a rule? No, there is not a rule. Um, as mentioned, you, this is, uh, you have to test this and see what works best in terms of what you want to identify. Is it possible to use SRTM to estimate vegetation height in places with higher elevation? It seems that using SRTM for estimating mangrove height works because we know that the ground at zero meter is, okay, yes. Um, yeah, actually, I think there've been some efforts along these lines and using, people have been using, for example, uh, um, digital terrain models. So uh, if you have a digital terrain model where you know like what is the elevation at the, at the surface, at the terrain level, and then you have something like SRTM, which is actually giving you the height of the, of the vegetation. Then you you, sub, you use you subtract them. Is it possible to use ALOS DM to calculate mangrove biomass? Um, again, as mentioned, you need to account for that. In that equation, the fact that the ALOS DM used optical data, and so that um, you don't have a signal penetration through the canopy, and so you need to account for that. Basically, the ALOS DM is really is is just an assessment of the top, and you need to modify the equation. How did we arrive on the calibration factor? That's a really good point. So that is provided by JAXA. They gave us the calibration factor and you kind of have to look around and in the document documentation for these mosaics to find what that calibration factor is. So um, that's, that's how I came up with that. I, I didn't invent it. it. It is a standard calibration factor uh, provided by JAXA. What is the formula you use for biomass calculation? Is it a global allometric equation for mangroves? Could you elaborate? So I can, um, if you send me an email, I can point you to some publications. Um, so this is just a general yeah, these are allometric equations for mangroves. And um, I can, yes, I, I can provide you more details through publications. Do you have any recommendation for the choice of the threshold in the case of Amazonian forest? Again, if you wanna do a classification of like forest type, for example, um, you you want to you want to do a classification, not a threshold. You want to use the threshold method when you're looking at change. So, for example, if you're looking at or if you're looking at areas that are vastly distinctive, okay, then you can apply a threshold. So, if you're looking at say areas that have been 
deforest or there's been some sort of vegetation loss between different years, you can use a threshold. If you have one image and you want to separate water from everything else, you could probably use a threshold because water is such is so uh, is so much lower usually in radar images than everything else. Sometimes not if there's wind, but usually. Or if you have an image where you have flooded forests and you want to separate that from everything else, usually flooded forests, inundated vegetation has such a higher backscatter than everything else that it, it would work just applying a threshold. Okay, question 46. Can you explain why you have to use absolute values when the elevation is zero or negative? Because, uh, yeah, if you have a negative value in that equation that I provide, so you're raising something to the power of, uh, you'll get a complex number. Is it appropriate to use Sentinel-1 or Sentinel-2 in urban area development? Also, can this tool be used to analyze the quality of water in a wetland or stream? Yeah, so this is sort of a little, this question is a little different. Um, yeah, probably Sentinel-2 would be your best bet for looking at urban area development. And if you're looking at water quality, you definitely want to use uh, something optically based. Sentinel-1, any radar is not going to give you an assessment of water quality. All right. So unfortunately, we are um, out of time, but we will get to the rest of your questions. Um, is there any, any more questions? We will get to these and we will post this Google Doc online. Remember, there is one more session with this webinar series, and that is forest uh, height estimation. We will have a guest speaker for that, Professor Paul Cicada from University of Massachusetts Amherst. That would be this Thursday, same time. Stay tuned. The homework will be announced at that during that session, as well as the due date. So see you all on Thursday for the last part of this webinar series. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for all the questions and uh, see you on Thursday. Bye-bye.